Good evening. Uh, my name is Alpesh Patel, and uh, we'll talk tonight about acute traumatic central cord injury and what the role and timing of surgery is in that setting. These are my disclosures. There's nothing related to the topic at hand, uh, and my disclosures are listed in the CSRS program. There's three keys I'd like us to leave with from our discussion tonight. One is that we come to an agreement that uh, on rather what the best descriptive language is of central cord. That is, what do we mean when we say a central cord injury? Second, let's define a strategy for the acute management of central cord injury, given that descriptive language. And then third, let's recall some key evidence that can help us drive towards the best in clinical decision-making for this injured population. As a bit of background, when we talk about central cord injuries, uh, these are often attributed to a couple of classic papers from the 1940s and 1950s describing plegia, paraplegia in the setting of normal radiographs, or describing in the Schneider case, the first described neurological syndrome documented as or described as central cord uh, injuries. However, it's interesting in, in, in these situations, even in the Schneider paper, these included patients with more traditional instability patterns, distractions, or translational injuries, as opposed to just individuals with hyperextension injuries in the setting of spondylosis. Well, what do we know in, the, in those studies and as well as in others, the most commonly reported, uh, and that's I think what many of us think of when we think of somebody being labeled as a central cord patient. However, the literature includes unstable injury patterns, as we mentioned before, discal ligament menis injury patterns, and also acute central disc herniations presenting with a central cord neurological pattern. And what is that pattern? Well, the classic distribution includes a varying degree of motor and sensory deficits, upper body more or upper extremities more than lower extremity involvement, distal motor involvement more than proximal motor involvement, and typically ventral tract sparing, so light touch sparing. However, the literature again is oftentimes includes patients with a substantial overlap with other spinal cord injury patterns to the extent that when we look at newer descriptors or newer classification systems, even in 2021, we can identify classification systems that include uh, instability modifiers, uh, as well as widely varying degrees of neurological involvement, but yet being described as central cord syndrome. And so I think what we're left with in the literature is that we're consistently inconsistent in how we define central cord injuries, both with regards to the mechanisms of injury, the underlying structural integrity of the spine, as well as at times the neurological picture that the patient goes through. So really we're asked this question of what do we mean when we label an injury as a central cord injury? Well, I think in 2021, this is oftentimes what we are talking to each other about as a group of surgeons and spine providers, spine professionals, um, is that of a structurally stable spine. So not a distraction or translation injury, but a structurally stable spine with a congenital or and or spondylotic stenosis and a varying neurological pattern, both in terms of absolute motor sensory deficit, but also in terms of the rate of change of that deficit over time. And this has oftentimes been lumped into a terminology of called acute traumatic myelopathy. And this may be more consistent with the actual neurological injury pattern we see, as well as the structural uh, integrity of the spine that we see uh, when describing quote unquote central cord injury. So with that definition in mind, let's think about what we know about operative and non-operative treatment. Well, non-operative treatment really is very limited in terms of the levels of evidence, but much of the literature is. These are small numbers of patients, retrospective studies, again, a mix of stable and unstable injury patterns, and very limited use of standardized outcome measures. There is a rationale for non-operative treatment that may ring true to many of us as we think about what was a rationale for non-operative management in other cord injury patterns. Older patients, that good results can happen from non-operative management, and that surgical risks, such as neurological decline, lean against surgical intervention. Well, let's tackle those one by one. Again, older patients, well, these are growing in number. We know that across North America, Europe, Asia, uh, and um, in many parts of the developing world, we see a growth in the number of older patients. These are more active and more able patients than ever before, and they have higher expectations than ever before. Also, some of the literature would suggest that the age group can be in, in this population can be as young as their 50s and 60s. 
Second is this notion that patients will somehow just get better with time, that with time they will improve both functionally and neurologically, with some studies reporting that up to 90% of patients were able to return home after an acute central cord injury. But the reality is that there's a lot of uncertainty in the acute recovery. We don't know which of these paths our patients are going to go down. Are they going to get better or not? Is it going to happen rapidly or slowly? And so that oftentimes, in the even after the acute setting, we can see some ongoing problems for patients with central cord injuries. They do not return to normal function. Again, they may have motor score improvement, but their functional measures and their SF36 remain substantially lower than that of the general population. So we've got to move beyond the motor score. We also have to think about things like progressive neurological decline, spasticity, and even pain that may be a leftover effect of, of the cord injury, as well as the ongoing compression in the setting of non-operative management. Surgical risk is there as well. Um, but again, we know that studies have shown repeatedly in the setting of a cord injured population that with aggressive and appropriate perioperative management, uh, neurological decline in this setting uh, um, is, 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 is not a uh, given, uh, and certainly that surgery can be performed safely. And so if we look at surgical results, we do know that they're safe, and we know we can obtain significant motor improvement with decompressive procedures in the setting of cord compression. And so maybe central cord syndrome is really closer to an acute incomplete spinal cord injury than we give it credit for. And if it is really just a variant of an acute incomplete central cord injury, maybe data like the SASCIS data can help drive us towards an understanding of why surgical uh, intervention is the right path for these patients. Um, and as a refresh, the, the SASCIS study looked at acute cervical cord injuries uh, treated either early or late with a 24-hour cutoff. Safety levels were equivalent in both groups, and recovery, neurological recovery, was substantially better in those who had surgery early versus late. So with the same mindset, we move towards this concept of in the setting of central cord injury, in patients who are not improving spontaneously neurologically, surgery seems to be the right answer for these individuals. Well, is there a proof in the setting of central cord injury? Yes, it certainly is. It's not robust. It's not overwhelming randomized data, but it's, there's data. Um, that have shown improvements in quicker recovery, shorter hospital stay, shorter rehab stay, better short-term results with surgical management. More recent evidence in larger cohorts of patients with spondylotic central cord syndrome shows better um, motor scores at six months and 12 months with early versus late surgical management and even better than non-surgical management. Lower process, um, um, uh, better process results like le less length of stay in the hospital, ICU stay, surgical complications. Um, but again, a very limited uh, um, in terms of the robustness of the data available. So then we lead to the conversation of, well, how soon should we can think about surgical management for this? And again, one study here, 101 patients, suggested that in this setting of acute um, uh, uh, a cord injury by central cord syndrome, uh, that there was no impact on Asian motor scores, whether it was at 24 hours, 25 hours um, to 72 or at 72 hours. But if we dig in a little bit deeper into the data, it's a small number of patients, 36, 38, 27 patients, um, um, uh, treated over 19 years. So lots of variance, variances in, in, in treatment there. And outliers on timing were pretty high. So it's really an underpowered study with quite a bit of noise to say that time does not matter when it comes to surgical management. Another study, we looked at this earlier, uh, identified better motor improvement scores in patients who had surgery within less than 24 hours compared to greater than 24 hours. Um, a confounding factor here is, again, a small number of patients in each group, 5, 24, 15, and a large number of unstable injury patterns driving most of the uh, improvements in upper extremity motor function that were identified. So lots of noise in this study as well, at the very least showing that surgical intervention helps improve motor function but again, not a defined enough group of patients to make this the quote unquote pure central cord syndrome. So in conclusion, I think we wanna to come to an agreement on a modern definition of central cord. And I think that concept of acute traumatic myelopathy really resonates and makes sense, right? It's a stable spine, spondylotic or congenital stenosis with an acute traumatic myelopathic event. Non-surgical care may be okay for a subset, but we really don't know how to identify those patients at time zero. We watch them for a little while in the hospital and see if they're improving or not. But if they're not improving, we move very rapidly to surgical decompression. Surgery is safe and likely in this setting offers those patients who are not improving on their own the best chance at neurological improvement. The question we don't know the answer to yet 
is with regards to early intervention. And that is really how early is early enough in this population. Thank you.